all those in U.S. military planes. All this, uh, this uh, traffic collision avoidance system in, uh, in all planes run by the Air Mobility Command, and that's uh, over 1,400 planes. That uh, has begun, um, but uh, it, uh, it, it's a long process. And I don't believe the entire process will be complete uh, until 2006 under the current schedule. Um, so far, um, uh, they've obviously all the, uh, the uh, planes that carry the President have, uh, have the TCAS traffic collision avoidance system in them. The two uh, Air Force Ones uh, have that. And um, a number of C-130s, a number of KC-135s, and, and uh, some C-20s um, have that system. I think so far only about 80 planes out of the more than 1,400 have been equipped with that. Um, we hope to have another um, uh, 270 planes uh, completed by 2001. That will be the primary passenger fleet uh, run by the Air Mobility Command. And then the rest of the planes, the cargo planes and the tanker planes, will be done by 2006. There are the planes that carry them. Excuse me. Go ahead. Sorry, the sec def, including the E-4s. Well, I, I can't answer that question, but I will certainly get an answer. I mean, they, they will be included in this, but uh, uh, when is the question? I was just simply asking you, uh, for that current schedule that you just laid out, is there, are there any plans to accelerate that? Anyway? I'm not aware that, um, that this schedule has been accelerated. I know that the uh, the, the uh, uh, that this is under review, and if there's a change, we'll let you know. Ken. Yes. Are, is the administration eliminating funds for burial ceremonies for veterans at the National don't, Cemetery? I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, it's, is it an issue being considered? I, I, you don't, I don't know anything know, about it. I, I, I've read a, uh, a report. In a, uh, in a newspaper, but I don't know the answer to it. Could you check on that? Let yes. Us Yes, I it can. sounds like a budget thing. Just you're eliminating money for burial. Well, I don't know whether it's eliminating money for the burials themselves or for some of the uh, the uh, this ceremonial activities that sometimes accompany burials. But I guess to you, it's one and the same. Right. Right. And I will check on that. Well, you let, that's fairly significant for mm -hmm. veterans in this country. You look forward to it when they were buried. Um, I, I will certainly. It's uh, a national. It's a national program, or na national. I, I, Pat, all I can do is check. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, the Secretary is due to report to Congress, I guess, by next Monday on his thoughts on this National Defense Panel. Can you just tell us whether he's done that yet or will he do it on time? Where is that in the process? Um, well, certainly in the process, because I've seen a draft. I don't know whether it has been done, and I will find out whether it's been done. I assume it will be done on time. Uh, the, uh, the report was uh, released on time, and I'm sure we'll get our response up on time. Everybody wants to stand. Let's please raise their hands. All in favor of adjourn, yeah. 55 percent aye. 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 A
see Doc Cook is con contributing to the noise factor here. Um, last June, I appointed a panel of private citizens to review gender integrated training and related issues in the Army, the Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps. Former Senator Nancy Kassenbaum Baker agreed to head this panel, and 10 distinguished citizens were appointed to serve with her. The panel includes retired senior military members, both officer and NCO, and distinguished representatives from academia, journalism, and the legal profession. Two panelists have served on the Defense Advisory Committee on Women and the Services, and many of the members are here today. The panel has met its deadline with a good report, and I want to thank Senator Kassenbaum and the members of the panel for their service. The jobs, the difficult jobs, of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines perform, uh, require rigorous training and effective discipline. And I've asked the panel to review how we train, how effective our training programs are, and what needs to be done to improve them. The panel focused on initial entry training, which includes both basic and advanced training. With the support of Congress, the military services have made significant progress in expanding opportunities for women. And the result is a strong, ready force that recruits from the entire population and assigns the most qualified individuals to serve in each military job. Today, 13.7% of active duty military members are women. 80% of all military specialties are open to women, including more than 99% of specialties in the Air Force and 91% in the Navy. Military um, women and men, and I want to emphasize it's both. Women and men are working together around the world to protect our national interests. Their commitment and effectiveness explains why our forces are so respected and so ready. It's critical, therefore, that our initial training programs effectively prepare, prepare them for service in today's gender-integrated military. It is in basic training that young men and women entering the all-volunteer force become soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. I've just received the report of Senator Baker's, uh, Senator Kassenbaum Baker's panel. Uh, the report recommends changes in the way we train our gender-integrated all-volunteer force. And I have now asked the military services to review their recommendations and report back to me within 90 days with their assessments. And I want them to uh, comment on the manpower, personnel, and cost implications of these recommendations. And most importantly, I've asked the services to study the impact that the panel's recommendations would have on force readiness and effectiveness. Uh, before you hear from Senator Kassenbaum, I again want to express my uh, deep and sincere appreciation to her. We had served uh, many years together on Capitol Hill in the Senate, and she uh, certainly was one of the most respected members in the Senate, remains one today as an effective voice in many different areas. And uh, I also want to express my uh, deep appreciation to all the panel members and the supporting staff. I am informed that they traveled to some 17 installations. They talked to more than 200, 2,000 rather, individuals. Uh, it's clear from the panel's report that Senator Kassenbaum shares my determination to make sure that military training is fair, it's demanding, and it's effective. Good training makes for a strong force. Senator Kassenbaum also shares my conviction that women are critical to today's military. They help make our force what it is today, uh, the best in the world. And before turning to Senator Kassenbaum, I'd like to entertain any questions briefly that, uh, that you might have. Mr. Secretary, you call this uh, a good report. Does that mean you agree with separate living quarters for young male and female recruits? And what would you say to charges by some that this abrogates leadership responsibility and that it, that it just simply doesn't teach young men and women to live together and work together? Uh, first of all, I indicated it is a good report. It does reflect the hard work that these distinguished panel members have put into this process. Uh, it is part of a process, however, and now that I have the report, I will uh, again submit it to the services for their comment and their uh, either criticisms or constructive recommendations uh, that will come back to me. And at that point, I will make a determination in terms of what our policy will be for the future. But it is simply at this stage a report submitted to me, which I will need the input from the uh, various services before coming to a conclusion as to whether any changes are necessary and whether these recommendations should be put into force. Well, may I ask you what your initial reaction is to separate the That is a good report. So, uh, so you're, you're, you're <laughs> neutral. Secretary. You're decidedly neutral. I, 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 I am neutral and open, as I've indicated before, uh, to all constructive uh, recommendations. And uh, this is part of the process. I would expect uh, the services to come back with uh, their assessment in terms of whether it is feasible, desirable, uh, and can be accomplished and will improve 
the uh, integrated military that we have today. When, when you look here on the, on the Hill already, we have gotten uh, statements from various uh, women leaders on the Hill saying it is definitely a step backward uh, if the Defense Department and the services uh, take this step. Do uh, you have any comment? on their criticism of the report when it's been off the presses for less than 24 hours? Well, I think um, much needs to be done in terms of reading the report. Uh, some of the stories that have been written uh, do not accurately reflect what is in the report uh, itself. This is uh, not, as I read it, a step backwards, but an attempt, or at least a, a series of recommendations by a very distinguished panel, which is made up of uh, both men and women, um, retired military and, uh, and non-military, uh, as I indicated, uh, those from the academic world as well as those from the legal profession. And it uh, is a recommendation that is designed to make our military the most effective uh, uh, in the world, as it is today, to enhance and improve uh, the integrated military that we have. And so I would uh, yield in a moment to the panel members, but I think that the, each one will assure you it is not their intent to have any step backwards, but to step forward and to provide the best uh, training possible and the most effective training possible to make sure that we continue to have uh, the best military in the world. Mr. Secretary. On the question of readiness, uh, and I'm backing into this one, uh, Iraq now seems to be intransigent in uh, not allowing the UN inspectors to have full access to all <coughs> locations. Uh, when last we met here, uh, you said that uh, military strikes were still a possibility and they would probably not be a pinbrick. Are we closer today to a military strike, and would you even say it's imminent? I would say that we have to wait until Mr. Butler um, files his report or makes his report to the Security Council, and that the most important thing is for the Security Council to remain firmly behind the position they have taken before, uh, that uh, all sites must be open, that no sites can be ruled either to be sensitive or presidential in nature that would require any uh, special uh, process. When we talk about uh, presidential palaces, uh, this is not the equivalent of um, uh, Iraqi inspectors uh, coming into the West Wing of the White House. Uh, we're talking about professional, uh, trained experts going into compounds that are acres, if not square miles in, uh, in size, uh, places which could, in fact, be used for either hiding documentation or uh, instruments uh, of weapons of mass destruction themselves. And so the position has been, and I would expect and hope that it would continue to be, no sites are off limits, and the, um, the Security Council will have to take whatever action it deems necessary at that point, and we should await what their recommendation would be for further action. Mr. Cohen, Mr. this report uh, suggests that uh, the military's system of training men and women together simply isn't working. And to quote from it, it says it's resulting uh, in less discipline, less unit cohesion, and more distraction from training. Do you agree with that? Uh, I think the uh, members should uh, speak to that particular issue uh, themselves. I have indicated I think it's a good report. Uh, I don't believe that uh, the report comes to the conclusion that uh, the current system isn't working, but rather they are recommendations uh, contained uh, in the report that would make it work better. And that has been the goal of the panel and certainly my goal, uh, any kind of recommendation that would make our system more effective, more efficient, more ready. Uh, and also succeed in uh, the continuation of promoting uh, the role of women in our military. And this is something that must be clearly understood. Uh, this uh, report does not in any way uh, reflect, in my judgment, uh, a step back from the progress we've made, but rather uh, is designed to say how can we make the total force, the integrated force, the most effective uh, we can for the future. So um, I see this as a good report that should be subjected to the scrutiny of the various services. Uh, also, uh, certainly uh, members of Congress are uh, going to uh, have commentary about it, but uh, we uh, have an obligation to really find the most effective force and uh, provide for the most effective force uh, in, the, in the world. Mr. Secretary, there are people who say that this report just uh, uh, gives uh, a support to those people who said women don't belong in the military, they don't belong in combat, and we told you so. Uh, how do you respond to that? Uh, I would say listen to the, uh, the members of the panel, look at who they are, what experience they bring uh, to the, uh, the panel's uh, uh, charter as such. Uh, they are diverse in nature, in background, in gender, in race. Uh, they represent, I think, uh, a broad spectrum of our society. 
uh, and uh, they are committed to, to having the best military force in the world with um, a commitment to make sure that women uh, will continue to enjoy um, an integral part and play an integral part uh, of our uh, military. So I would say that uh, uh, they should not draw that conclusion from this report, but the individual panel members, especially uh, Senator Kassenbaum Baker, uh, should address that directly. On Iraq again, if I can ask, um, officials there today have scoffed at the report that you're going to vaccinate the troops against anthrax as uh, unnecessary. What do you say to them? Um, they say it's unnecessary? Uh, well, in view of the fact that uh, um, the report that I filed just a, a couple of weeks ago indicated that uh, the threat of chemical and biological weapons is going to proliferate in the future, uh, we see this as a, a necessary precaution. Uh, for all of our men and women in the service, wherever they may serve. And so uh, we think it is necessary and it's time that we start as soon as we can and we will begin that process uh, by uh, April or May. Uh, and so it's something that uh, a threat that uh, is uh, there today, it was, it's likely to increase and intensify in the future by virtue of so many additional countries getting access to weapons of mass destruction, including anthrax. And so we think it's a necessary precaution. Secretary, the service chiefs have all looked at their training and gender integrated uh, aspects of it uh, several times this year in result, response to uh, various things that have happened, and all of them have endorsed what they're doing. Why do you think this is going to change with their mind? Well, I think that uh, the chiefs uh, uh, should always be willing to re-examine their policies. If uh, good ideas are presented to them, they uh, certainly are, should be open. Uh, to considering them. They may, upon examination, say that we uh, do not think this will enhance our capability or our readiness, uh, morale, uh, or uh, other uh, issues involved. Uh, but that's for them to, to examine and then to respond uh, in a uh, constructive fashion. So uh, I see uh, this as simply part of a process which uh, needs to uh, be examined. Uh, it's part of the recommendation that I made, being willing to uh, look at uh, issue of this magnitude. Uh, other members of the panel, again, will address the issue. This should not be confined uh, or uh, considered to deal with uh, simply uh, sex in the military as such, uh, but rather how do we make uh, the integrated training that we have today more effective so we deal with some of the issues that are involved in some of the charges that we've read about in the past. But it's really much broader than that, and it is designed uh, to uh, say how do we produce the best uh, people that we uh, can produce to serve in the military and to make it the most effective. Ultimately, will it be your decision to decide whether or not you change the way men and women are trained and when will you make that decision? Uh, ultimately, it's a decision that uh, I would make and I will make it uh, after um, the services have had a, an opportunity to examine it and then report back to me and then obviously I would consult with the services, with the Joint Chiefs and, uh, and make a recommendation for change if change is warranted. Sir, I would like to leave a little bit of time for the panel members who have really worked very long and hard on this. So, Just one okay. last question. I mean, there, there are some other fairly provocative conclusions in the report, setting aside the, the integrated training one. One is that uh, recruiters seem to be routinely uh, misleading uh, uh, people they're recruiting. Another one is that the, the whole training process has gotten just a lot too soft. Would you care to say anything about either of those two? Well, I'd like to leave that for the members to address. They're the ones who have been out in the field talking uh, to the, the troops, talking to the uh, drill instructors, talk, talking uh, to, uh, uh, to officers uh, and, and NCOs. So I think that they are in a better position to answer that. I simply have received this report. Uh, I am then going to uh, obviously study it myself, but then get the recommendations of the Joint Chiefs and, uh, and the uh, Chiefs of the Services. Okay, if I could uh, now turn the podium over to uh, Senator Kassabon Baker. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Uh, let me say it's been a great honor to chair this task force, and the reason is that uh, the, the men and women that I have worked with on this task force, I have never seen a group that has brought greater expertise and thoughtfulness to the efforts before us, and I would like to introduce them now. Uh, first, retired Vice Admiral Richard Allen, United States Navy, former commander, Naval Air Force, U.S. Atlantic Fleet. John Dancy, a former broadcast journalist with NBC News. Retired Major General Donald Gardner, United States Marine Corps, former commander of the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Force, Japan. Good morning. We had hoped that uh, General uh, Marsleet Harris could be here, retired Air United States Air Force General. She was meeting her mother at the airport at 1230. And uh, 
so far she, she still isn't here. The Honorable Deval Patrick, who is fo a former Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights. Ms. Ginger Lee Simpson, Master Chief Petty Officer, retired United States Navy, and former Director of the United States Navy Senior Enlisted Academy. She's also a current member of Dakowitz. Professor Marilyn Yarborough, who's professor of uh, School of Law, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, an expert on Title IX law. The panel also included, included three more members whose schedules didn't allow them to be here today. Retired Lieutenant General Robert Foreman, United States Army, who was former Deputy Commanding General uh, Training and Doctrine Command. Dr. Condoleezza Rice, Provost at Stanford University and former Senior Director of the National Security Council. <coughs> Dr. Carolyn Ellis Staten, who is Associate Provost at the University of Mississippi and former Vice Chairman of Dakowitz. It has been, as you can see, a diverse group. We didn't know each other before we, very well before we started out on this project. And they, uh, it has been a group that I think has really entered in with enthusiasm uh, in undertaking this assignment. We've all learned a lot. I never believed I'd ever be up for Reveille uh, before, <laughs> but uh, I, I would also like to introduce some of the staff, and I know this is taking up some time at press conference, but as you well know, it's that kind of work that makes it all possible. Uh, the executive director is Dr. Lori Esposito Murray, former special advisor to the president of the Chemical Weapons Convention. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Bradford Liu, United States Army senior military <coughs> advisor who was a big help to us. John Walcott, senior advisor. I would like to thank all of the services for the help they gave us as we visit the installations, as we ask for um, information on exactly how the training was being done. Uh, also to Senior Master Sergeant uh, William Green, who helped us as Administrative Officer, Jan Vulovich, who's an assistant, uh, who has assisted me, and Peggy Coyle, Assistant to the Executive Director. Just getting on to a couple of comments about the report. First, let me say our mission was to assess the current military programs to determine how best to train our gender integrated all volunteer force to ensure that they are a disciplined, effective, and ready force. We feel strongly in support of gender integrated training. We feel strongly that uh, even more areas should be made open to women in the military and salute the advances that have been made over the past several years in that regard as doors have been opened. And thirdly, we believe there can be a stronger program of training that will benefit both men and women in the armed forces. We unanimously agreed on that. And I think we should not somehow get sidetracked into thinking we were asked to play Dr. Ruth we were asked to look at this in the light of what could enhance our military services and provide for the young men and women the training they deserve and the training I think that they want. I would just like to take a few minutes to go over the, some of the basic points of the report and then I would like to uh, open it to, to questions uh, for all of us uh, as we would respond. First, it is a comprehensive report. And we really hope that it will be looked at as a package, starting with recruit policy. We recommend that we link recruiters' full credit for recruitment to the recruits' performance in basic training so that it ties directly the recruiting officer, not to say that recruiting officers aren't all doing a good job, but that that, again, could be strengthened and as that tie uh, becomes in, uh, comes into force. Utilize the delayed entry program so that recruits better understand what will be required of them both mentally and physically. Increase the number of female recruiters. In the training cadre, we want to improve the screening of training cadre candidates prior to selection. Increase the number of tra the training cadre. Increase the number of female trainers. Encourage volunteers by improving incentives and rewards so that training assignment is career enhancing. And perhaps that's the most important because the training cadre in many ways is the backbone and how these young men and women relate depends on how they relate 
to those who are responsible for their training. And right now, it isn't viewed as as much of a career enhancing position as it should be and we believe can be. We also think we ought to, there should be a clarification of the trainer's authority. Regarding basic training organization, we do call for separate barracks for male and female recruits. This is not designed to say that we were worrying about sexual harassment so much as we believe what exists is not really enhancing unity or cohesion at the platoon level or the uh, division or the flight level. And why this is so is because there's become, because of trying to figure out exactly what to do to provide a strong basic gathering together of young men and women, we've, we've lost sight of the forest through the trees. And so as a result, we adopt no touch, no talk policies, and yet at the same time we're saying, oh, but let's have everybody in the same barrack. Well, what good does it do if really you can't even discuss? We call for elimination of no talk, no touch, and make it, we hope, more realistic to what actually exists and sort of instead of up on a chart saying this is gender integration and yet in reality it doesn't exist. So it's far better, I think, to be realistic about, we believed, what would work most successfully. Uh, it's not a, a problem that's generated by women. And I would say right now, I think it's very unfair somehow to make women the scapegoat of, for what may be viewed by some as weakened uh, military training. That is not the issue and unanimously we believe that actually uh, women are a major and strong force. But what has been weakened is the requirements that we've made for both men and women as they enter our armed services today. Uh, the committee uh, has reviewed uh, the barracks at, at many of the installations uh, and believe that uh, this can be accomplished at minimal cost. Uh, so we are trying to, I think, put logic back into the system where we have sort of confused the structure in order to fit how we think it should be instead of what really would work most successfully. At the gender integrated training installa installations, organize same gender platoons, divisions, and flights, and that would continue gender integrated training, however, above those levels, unit levels. So as you know, a platoon is uh, your, your lowest level. And as that platoon moves up four platoons into a company, where that training occurs together as a company, which is classroom instruction, field training, those are a technical training, those are integrated as they are today and would continue to be, and a continued pairing in the Air Force and in the Navy. <coughs> we would also require toughen basic training requirements and enforce consistent standards for male and female recruits, toughen physical fitness requirements and expand instruction on nutrition and wellness in split option recruitment in the Army, review attrition rates and determine whether improvements need to be made in providing more leeway to discharge recruits from the services. Eliminate the use of Navy stress cards. Now, I've suggested maybe stress cards should be handed out at the Pentagon, too. <laughs> Under teaching professional relationships, improve instruction on how males and females should relate to each other professionally, and, by, and then calling for the elimination of no talk, no touch policies. There is an element of, again, I think reality that we've hoped to bring just good common sense to some of this, which I, we believe will enhance the whole training process. Enforce policies to eradicate disparaging references to gender. Teach consistent rules on fraternization and enforce tough punishments for false accusations regarding sexual harassment and misconduct. In the advanced school, Strengthen discipline continuum from basic training into advanced training in order to maintain high standards of discipline and military bearing throughout the training cycle. Prepare basic training graduates better for the lifestyle change in advanced school and prepare advanced school graduates better for the lifestyle change in the operational unit. 
We maintain separate barracks for male and female students in, in advanced school as well. And review the initial uh, early training curricula to shift more training into uh, the uh, initial training uh, in order to reduce the training requirements of the operational units. That's a little more in-house then. Under values training, improve values training in all initial entry training programs, uh, which includes uh, advanced as well as basic. And under resources, increase training resources to improve staffing and infrastructure. Let me say this was unanimously supported by a diverse group of 11 members of us of this task force. And I would hope, as I say, would be viewed as a package. Also, probably the bottom line is leadership. That's what is most important. Leadership that's willing to set standards and take responsibility for those. If you don't have that at all levels, you really don't uh, accomplish much but whatever you put up on the bulletin board that should be done. And so it is part of the training process that we would hope would start out with the recruit. And with that in mind, whether they stay in the services as one would hope, and continue to give that expertise or whether they go back into the communities. So it's an opportunity and we, I guess, regard that as offering greater opportunity to the men and women who are serving instead of getting so hung up on whether it's just separate barracks and living together. We think it is a broader, more important package than just that and we'd be glad to answer questions. Senator, you, you are recommending that the Army, Navy, and Air Force change in having these basic students live separately. Are you also recommending that the Marines begin joint training at the company level and in basic training make that change? Conversely? Well, Marines, as you know, do have 17 days of combat training at their company level. Now that uh, is before they go into advanced and it's higher up in, in the chain, that's correct. But they do do it there and that's the same area where basically it's in, in, more enforced in the other services as well. I think we could all say we would hope as the Marines review their policies they will see it working well uh, in the other services and what we're doing is trying to lift the whole, the whole process forward. And uh, it's not necessarily taking down, it's taking everything up. And it isn't just the integration. That will come if you have strong, a strong training procedure. And I, I think that is only fair to the men and women involved. What you appear to be doing with the conclusions of the report, at least in part, is rejecting uh, a basic philosophical building block that the Army in particular has instituted, which is train together, fight together. Um, tell us if you believe the train together, fight together, and if your report is in fact taking that and setting it aside. Train separately initially, then train together, fight together as you get more grown up. Well, and, you know, I'm going to ask others, but the, those who train together today aren't going to be fighting together. Your basic platoon level isn't going to be the one ending up together uh, as if they go to fight. So what we're saying is, uh, you, you, this chart shows, it isn't very good here, but in the blue, the platoon level is 60 trainings. That's what you take. As it goes up into the company level, you are integrated again. But as you would fall out in the morning, so it's really sort of as you live, you train to a certain extent because as you fall out, you're doing the physical training. But I'd like to have others uh, offer comments on this too. Marilyn? Well, I just say it's, I think it's a misconception that we're saying train separately. We're saying separate barracks. But the training in the classroom, the training in the field, the technical training will be together. It's simply that people will not be living together on the same floor or in the same <coughs> building. But at any point above that platoon level, People will be together, and that's about 70% of the time in basic training. But your they physical training will be yeah. marching. To, as you do your physical training, yeah. that will be separate. You come together in the rest of it, which by is it by company. Yeah. 70% of the time. Well, one of the, one of the problems is that you said you found the drill instructors basically are saying that they're 
overwhelmed with basically a babysitting, trying to separate men and women and keep them from misbehaving, so to speak. And, and some uh, service personnel say that basically by separating people, all you're really doing then is delaying them learning how to work to, and live together in combat. For example, that once they hit the ship, they're going to be on the same ship together. Well, you know, so at some are point, you, aren't, are you, they, aren't we all requiring everybody to be a little more responsible? Well, why can't they be required to be responsible from the very beginning? Because you enter in with a different process, and it isn't you're signing up for a tough job, and this is part of the initial training. Duvall, you want to answer well, some I of that? I think that we've gotten hung up a bit on. Well, at the risk of hanging us up further, uh, <laughs> we, we, are, we are talking about housing teenagers in separate dormitories for the first six to ten weeks of their military career. Six to ten weeks. And the training that runs at the dormitory level, I'm using civilian terms, if you will, would, be, would continue to run at the dormitory level. Seventy percent of the time, the training, even from day one, is gender integrated, preparing, we think, uh, uh, recruits for a gender integrated military experience going forward. That's what we're talking about. That is a small piece of a whole, as the Senator said, uh, and, a, and I think, uh, 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 frankly, a, a, uh, a piece that has been blown uh, entirely out of proportion to its, uh, to its significance. Let me just uh, add, add to uh, Deval Patrick's comment, if I may. I understand the importance of what, what you're referring to in the Navy of when you get to the ship, you are integrated, and that is really true. And I'm positive it is the service, uh, the Navy's interest, to try to train that way in order to allow the new member who joins that ship to totally understand the integration policies. We are not trying to avoid that in any way. What we are recommending is that we build the unit cohesion in boot camp with the separate companies such that when, when the core values are taught, they're taught in that environment. When, when the personal responsibilities are taught, they're taught with a unit cohesion and that unit can attach themselves to that cohesive nature. That doesn't degrade the integration policies of the services in, in any way. In our uh, un, uh, unanimous view, it would enhance the ability then for the, for the young people to better understand the integration requirements and the reason why men and women must operate together in the field. Wait, just, oh, excuse me. Admiral, could I ask you and the other uh, retired military members of the panel, did you have a sense before you left, or have you, do you have a sense now from your contacts with people who are still in the service, that the quality in the, of the preparation of folks who are coming to the fleet or coming to the, to the Army uh, and, and the other services has deteriorated, that those people are less prepared and as a result that the, the, the services are less ready? No, what I saw, and, and I saw this uh, everywhere I, I went, and I think the other uniform members would agree, that the quality of the average recruit is extremely high. These are sharp kids, and they're not all kids. Uh, we have 33-year-old recruits uh, in some cases. Uh, these are quality people that are being recruited to volunteer their service to their country and to their individual service. Uh, we saw top quality uh, personnel, I can guarantee you. I did not see uh, a lowering of the quality standards. I may, if I may, I'd like to ask Ginger Lee Simpson uh, to, to respond to some questions as well from, uh, from a little different perspective as someone who served as a non-commissioned officer. <laughs> I'm the enlisted representative the enlisted. of the panel. <laughs> One of the things that I want to really uh, make emphasis on is fundamentally in the military, when you join the military, fundamentally there is a socialization process that must take place. And having been a former recruit company commander in the 1970s and then leading those very recruits as young and very, in some cases, very senior uh, enlisted people in the end before I retired, I can tell you that um, both from a female recruit standpoint, a male recruit standpoint, and in general the leadership of those recruits, it is imperative that initial socialization skills, both by in gender 
it, it's critical to the success of all integration. And so to me, uh, recommending that people start separately in terms of their living quarters only was the it was a tough decision I think we agonized over it quite quite a lot but in the end what we want to happen is is that we want men and women to understand the integration is going to take place number one number two that fundamentally in the socialization process it must start with the right role models both men and women we are not saying we want women to lead women and men to lead men we want the role models in both places but that in terms of logistics it is very difficult for the services to try to put the men and the women together and make them one when in fact they're living in two separate different places the cohesion of that is what is getting disconnected and that is why we want we want to go back to that initial 10 weeks roughly initial training as separate living quarters but trained together I don't think there's anything different than it's happening right now other than the fact that we tried to put men and women together in the same physical building and it didn't work because of the cohesion problems that we had Can you address uh, some of the concerns uh, from females in the ranks who are telling us privately because they can't speak to us publicly because they're wearing a uniform that they think this is a step backwards that they are strongly against this speak to your uh, sisters uh, in My uniform sisters in, uh, brothers in uniform yeah, or whatever yes um, I didn't see this as a step backwards what I what I think of it is as a step away to step back and look at what we're doing what we saw was tremendous confusion at the recruit level it's great to have an integration policy in recruit training but you the leadership as well as the recruits themselves were confused how am I supposed to really act I'm you you tell me that I'm integrated but I can't talk to my opposite gender counterpart during the whole time and yet we want this unit cohesion to happen and we were we were putting things in place to stop that as well the leadership of those recruits also discussed their frustration with trying to enforce policies and not having enough time to actually spend to de develop those people through their socialization process so that's what I say I do not say it's a step back at all I just say nothing major has changed here other than we want to live in a separate quarters I want you to have a male company commander or whatever the correct terminology is for that service I want you the men to have a female role model as well uh, your goal was to have them uh, train together but live apart yes but didn't you say that, there was, that some of the training as a result of this living in separate barracks wouldn't some things that are now co-ed in fact be segregated uh, under this proposal what we're finding is a very small percentage we went through hour by hour of the recruit training and we're finding very small percentage differences of the actual time to use your words, segregated from their gender brothers, if you will, or sisters, as the case may be. So to me, it was sig insignificant by numbers because much of their training in their, in their barracks is, has to do with how to fold their clothes properly. And as a male, I don't need to know how to fold a, you know, clothes. On television today, when we're showing pictures of men and women training together in yes. boot camp, we see a, a woman crawl through the mud and then followed by men crawling through the mud. Are we still going to see those we pictures? We sure are. Absolutely. That's, that's, not, field that's, field not, living. that's field training. That's not living together. May I ask a question, uh, Senator Gazzalo, if I may, Gazzalo Baker. Congratulations yes. to the left of the fact. Uh, would, uh, <laughs> would this panel have uh, reached its conclusion, do you believe, if it had not been for the sexual scandals at Aberdeen and elsewhere in the military? Would yes. Would you come to the same conclusion? Yes. yes. We unanimously would say yes. Absolutely. Just to follow that up, though, the, the, the scandals at Aberdeen are what focused attention on this and was the genesis for this panel's appointment. But it seems that uh, when you, most of the recommendations that you're making affect basic training as opposed to the advanced training that goes no, on No, we at had some pretty tough advanced school recommendations, too, which I just read. And, and continue, a continuum of discipline, uh, the training cadre, which really starts earlier but uh, continues through. So do you have a, the report? It, it's, a, it's a pretty lengthy recommendations on advanced school as well. And it's... <laughs>
<laughs> and separate barracks <laughs> separate barracks are maintained. There's a reference made in the report to the fact that uh, the people who are involved in training believe that people as, as trainees aren't treasured enough, that in fact more attention is lavished on weapons systems than on people who are really supposed to be the core of, of, of well, the training. Well, I, I don't think we... And that the, cut, the, the, the cuts like in, in yeah. budget are, have been such that not enough attention has been paid to recruiting, training. Well, now, we didn't say lavished on, on no, weaponry. No, an individual that's quoted as saying this, though. Not in, the, in our in the report. recommendation. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, yes. what we say is we need more resources. Okay. We do well, need money. more... We do need more money, and we recommend that so for that line, training. Yeah. Well, we're not no. saying we don't have, no, it isn't. No. It's just that we believe that individuals are a very important part of the military. We would all agree with that. Uh, you need the technical expertise and the discipline to, to utilize the highly technical weapons today. And we believe more resources should be uh, in training and so forth, but I'll, I'd like to call on General Gardner here. Let me answer the resources question for you, but before I do that, let me uh, um, get a word in about the beginning of this uh, news conference and, uh, and the report itself. Let me be absolutely clear to you that this is not a step backwards, nor can it be. The demographics of this country will not produce an all-volunteer force unless we return to the draft, unless you use women. They're in all the services and number about 13 percent of the services, and they are there to stay. And what missions we are given in the future will include women at some point in, those, in all of the services doing their piece of this. So this cannot be viewed as a step backwards, nor should it be. Now let me answer her question about resources. We made a strong recommendation to the Secretary of Defense that drill instructors, drill sergeants, and the people who do the training sometimes don't feel like this is career enhancing. One of, the, one of several ways to make being a drill instructor or a drill sergeant career enhancing and getting them to volunteer to do the duty and getting the very best soldier, there are lots of demands made by the Department of Defense on all soldiers at all levels to do, get the best soldiers to do everything. The Century and the Secretary's office all the way down to you know, teaching and instructing. Lots of billets requiring the very best. And we don't want, as, a, as panel members, for the drill instructors and the drill sergeants, whether they are male or female, not to be the very best drill sergeants and drill instructors that this nation can produce because they are training the young people who are going to do the mission that this department gives them for the future. And if it's career enhancing, we've got to do more for them to make it career enhancing. Perhaps it's as simple as a laundry allowance. Perhaps it's as simple as a promotion opportunity uh, following a successful tour as a drill instructor or a drill sergeant. Uh, perhaps it's a few more drill sergeants so that they get some time off and can do some quality time with their families. They work more hours, the drill sergeants, male and female, work more hours than all of us do in this room. Every day. All day. In a very stressful job. And some of them don't think it's career enhancing. And we can certainly, as services, all of us, all the services, do a better job of making it more career enhancing. And it will cost a little bit more money than we are spending on it now because we're going to look for some additional drill sergeants you know, from the personnel sides of all the services to do this job with. But that's a matter of priorities. It's not necessarily a matter of more money. It's a matter of what's important. And this panel is saying to the Secretary of Defense that right now this is more important than anything else you may have to do with your money. So we're asking you to prioritize it better and find some more to find us some additional drill sergeants. That's what we're asking. Does that answer your question about resources? General, you're not only talking about drill sergeants and uh, drill instructors, yeah. though. You're also talking about um, uh, regular training when they get into advanced individual training or into the A schools. You're talking about trainers there, too, right? Yes. Uh, drill, drill, trainers. drill, drill, because the services use drill sergeants at both places. Right, but how about the regular military, military trainers? Where, uh, 
you know, they're going to be taught, they're going to be teaching a MOS uh, skill. No, no, we, we are interested in increasing the ratio of drill instructors and drill sergeants with the number of recruits that are on the drill field today. The number is too great. In some cases, it was 60 to 1. 1 to 200. 1 to 200 in, a, in one place. And there are just too few drill sergeants to meet the need. And ratio-wise, it's out of balance, and it needs to be fixed. And we've asked the secretary to take a look at it. And I think he will. Senator Kessel Baker, uh, perhaps you heard me earlier ask a, a question of Secretary Co uh, Cohen, and he referred it to the panel. But as I was reading this report, it, it seemed to imply that the current system was not working, to use my words. And I read this short portion here where it said, the present organizational structure and integrated basic training is resulting in less discipline, less unit cohesion, more distraction from training programs. Yes. Doesn't that say that the system's not working now? We would say that the status quo is not acceptable. Senator. And can you just elaborate, when you talk, since we're on this point about what training is separate and what isn't, can you give us an example of the kinds of training under your proposal that would be separate, men and women, and what would still be integrated? Right there. Well. The same training? <coughs> But, I mean, there's 60 trainees in a platoon. They would, these, would, the platoons would all be in the same barrack. As they would fall out in the morning for morning march, they fall out as a platoon. As of all they, one gender. That, at, at platoon level. That doesn't mean that the trainers, however, we would, we would encourage both male, female trainers so you don't have same gender trainers for the same gender platoon, say. But then as they, as they would go into any exercise during the day that's classroom or as they go into field training, as they would go into rifle practice, when you've got a technical practice, you are doing it as a company, and that's integrated. So you have 70% of the time in the Army's training is uh, integrated gender integrated training. So it's a, it's a small portion, but we believe an important way that enhances cohesion by separating it out. Can That's all I'd like to call. Yeah, follow up on his question, if I may. Aren't you, in a sense, asking for the same kind of trouble the Army had in Aberdeen if you're going to have a male drill instructor or drill sergeant in charge of 60 female trainees at a barrack level? Be male, female, no. We, we will have, at the barrack level, they would have to, if it was a female platoon, and the, it's a barrack of female uh, recruits, there would have to be a female trainer there. Well, there would also be a male trainer. But it is important, and in the male barracks, it would be the same, a male trainer and a female. But th that isn't... And, and Aberdeen is, is really a question of a continuum of discipline and responsibility and leadership that we hope to instill through the whole process by some of these changes. Yeah. When you talk to people in the ranks, what was the, the single biggest complaint you heard from men and the single most frequent complaint you heard from women about? Well, I, I think Ginger Lee Simpson spoke to that well. For one thing, the, the, those who are being asked to comment on the report, not that many could have read this whole report, because really we thought it wasn't going to be handed out until today. Uh, so uh, those, we talked to over 1,000 recruits, uh, over 500 trainers or so. From the recruits, both male and female, I would have to say, it was mixed. Oh, tough and the physical. They think basic is training. They think the, the bivouac, the field exercises aren't as tough as they could be. And certainly for physical training, they expected it to be tougher, would like it to be tougher. Now, you talk to officers, and they say, well, that's always what recruits say. Uh, but we're going to take them at their word <laughs> and recommend that indeed it be so. Um, I would say it's mixed. Some of the... Uh, Female recruits, in all honesty, would would want to continue uh, barrack living together, and uh, the it it felt they felt it worked okay. Uh, certainly, some of the male recruits believe so too, uh, but there were a great number that also supported separate. Do you see any so need to make changes in the service academies? Well, that wasn't our mission, right? But you're still talking about the same. I mean, we're point. having enough trouble with just this. <laughs> John, you want to? I, I had hoped to get through this without saying anything. Uh, 
until a few months ago, I sat uh, where a lot of you sit, uh, although not in this particular venue. Uh, my role was to be uh, sort of the role I played as a reporter was to be the independent, neutral observer and experienced asker of questions, and uh, that's what I tried to do uh, during the time I served on this committee. Uh, let me just say uh, to all of you, having sat where you sit, don't go away from this and write that this panel is recommending a step back from gender integration. That is just simply not so. What we are trying to do is make gender integration work uh, better uh, than it does. Um, you've all covered the Pentagon and you know how things work here. The generals uh, and the admirals at the top uh, propose uh, a policy like gender integration and it all sounds fine uh, on paper. But when you get down to the level of the drill sergeants and the drill instructors and the recruit division commanders where the rubber meets the road, these are the guys who've got to make this policy uh, somehow work. And so uh, they look at, at a policy which says, okay, let's integrate men and women into the same units. And they think, how can I do this? And so they independently institute a policy which says, okay, you can march with them and you can eat with them, but you can't talk to them, you can't touch them, and you can't even look at them for more than three seconds because that is considered to be uh, sexual harassment. Well, this is not the policy, but that is in fact uh, what happens out there. What we're trying to do is to bring some rationality uh, to this process and make it work uh, a little better than it does. Did you, uh while you were discussing this, did you decide at any point that you might want to look at setting different rules for the Army and Marine Corps where many more of the jobs are combat related that women cannot uh, handle? No, we never did. Well, uh, what I'm wondering from the Air Force and the Navy's perspective, do you think that they are have a legitimate concern that you're imposing standards on them that are working fine in those services but don't work in a ground combat force like the Army and the Marine Corps? I'm, I'm uncomfortable trying to answer that. That's for them to decide like to, uh, the legitimacy of, of what we recommend. You, you also, you call for a crackdown on false charges of harassment, sexual harassment. Yeah. Did you find a trend or a tendency towards such false charges in the military now? It, the fear of, yeah, I think that's the best way to put it. I, I would just like to answer, you know, there are the special missions, there is the question of combat. Our, our task was to, to propose what we felt would give our young men and women the best basic training. We are strongly supportive of women moving into new areas, and I think where they're trained and where the services look to expansion, that's then a decision that they must make. But first and foremost, we're proud of the young men and women that serve. We believe that we can do something to enhance that service, and that was the thrust of our report. And I'll take one more question here. The, the Army and Navy particularly have, you know, have worry that the recruits are getting harder and harder to get, and they have to, they're worried about their attrition rate in boot camp. So when you say tough and trained, they all say, we'd like to do it, but we have to worry, worry about the breakage rate. You know, the kids that come in are not as well, uh, not physically fit, they're certainly not disciplined, and if we push them too hard, we either, we either drive them out, you know, they DOR, or they, uh, or they bur physically break. You know, so aren't you running a, a bounce here? We, we've got to feed the... Then the it, we're doing a real disservice to those young men and women. They either ought to be, have, that's why we support a, a better use of the delayed entry program, so they'll understand what is required of them, both in physical and mental training. And it isn't easy. I had asked myself if I could go through recruit training and survive. Uh, it is not easy. Uh, and I, I think anyone who's been there and followed a day through with a recruit recognizes that. But I would also say we shouldn't lower our standards just to get the numbers. Could you, could you clarify one thing about this uh, uh, tough punishment for false charges of sexual harassment or sexual misconduct? Some people have suggested that that sends a a chilling message to, to legitimate victims of sexual harassment that they'll be less willing to make charges if they feel that they have to have an overwhelming burden of evidence. Could you just talk about that? If, no, if you look at the language, our concern is with intentionally false charges. 
not with the person who has interpreted this, this as sexual harassment where someone else would not, but if there can be proof of intentional false charges, which is some of the fear that the drill instructors have, then we think that that ought to be dealt with. And we think that that would discourage then intentionally false charges, but leave way and not chill those that are appropriate and, uh, and um, may just be mistaken or not found or whatever. So we're trying to make a distinction between those two things. Thank you very much. Thank we you. appreciate it. Thank you. It's been a great privilege. Thank you.